thank you so much for attending tonight, joining this, what I think will be a fun and fascinating uh, topic, digestive enzymes, just a little bit of detail so that I can help make this experience easy for you and you know what to expect. I'm going to be talking for about 45 minutes and I will introduce myself more formally in, in a minute. And then I'm going to take questions at the end. So if you have questions, um, my request is to please put them in the Q&A area. Um, so I'm going to check the Q&A area at the end for the questions. But if you want to just chat with one another, that you can do in the chat area. Um, in the chat joining you is Wesley, who is uh, co-hosting with me tonight, kindly helping out. If you have questions while I'm talking, he can try to help you with that. Um, Wesley, I did hear a little bit of clanging in the last minute or so, so I'm not sure if you're properly muted. If you could please... Uh, mute yourself. I assume it must be you because everyone else is automatically muted. And that's it. So I wanted to thank Healthy Planet and Now who are co-sponsoring this talk tonight so much for allowing me to be here and to share this fun talk with you. So just as a by way of a quick introduction, if you haven't already attended uh, my talks, I have done a quite a few for Healthy Planet. You can go on their YouTube channel and see some of my other talks. They're all recorded there, um, which reminds me, this is being recorded and you will get a copy of the recording to your email um, sometime shortly after, I'm assuming. Now, uh, yeah, so I am Talia Charney. I have a very long history, which I won't get into, I'm involved in nutrition and health, I having seen clients for years, and I've studied many different disciplines, uh, you know, traditional Chinese medicine and herbal medicine and homeopathy and a uh, personal trainer and etc. So a lot. And I'm the author of three books. Right now, I'm the nutrition and health education manager for Now Foods Canada. And I'm a holistic nutrition and wellness coach. I'm also a uh, educator and speaker. And most importantly, hopefully this will come through. My training values are always try to be honest, objective, and as much as anyone can be, nuanced, and a little humble too. Now you don't know my family, but I want to introduce you to at least my work, my now family. Now the now family is quite a big family, but this is the core family you're looking at. Now is a family owned company for 54 years now. And Elwood Richard here is the founder. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. Um, now is a wonderful, kind family. And if you want to know more about this family and the story of now, which is really fascinating, you can go to nowfoods.ca, which is the website where you can find all information. And there's an amazing and free book you can download there. It's called Beating the Odds. And it's about this fascinating story, kind of like a rags to riches, but not exactly, but it's very interesting. Just a little peek into our labs. We have eight labs on board, very sophisticated, um, over 200 scientists in our quality area. We do an average of 16,000 quality tests every month. And just an example is we can test for over 500 pesticides. But we are, I would say, known to be quality obsessed, which is not a bad thing. And of course, the obligatory disclaimer for your sake and my sake too. This presentation is for informational purposes only, so it does not constitute the practice of medicine, naturopathy, or any health profession. That means any information written or stated here, or materials linked from here, or questions answered at the end are at the user's own risk. The great thing is you can always check any product for the suggested uses, what doses are correct, or any cautions or contraindications. You can find them on the products. You can go to nowfoods.ca to see those as well. And there's more information there 
then you will see on the products itself. So if you want to know something like, is it vegan? Is it you know, gluten-free, uh, got soy, those sort of things you will find there as well. All right, let me take a sip of water and let's dive into our topic about enzymes. So just look to the, oh, I can't believe I forgot to uh, get my laser pointer. I'm quite obsessed with it. The right side here. So this is a, a kind of a simplified but still interesting view of how digestion occurs in the body. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of background, I'm not going to too much detail, but that's a good start since we're talking about digestive enzymes. When you eat your food, the first thing that happens is you have some salivary, some enzymes produced in your mouth, mostly breaking down carbohydrates, at least starting to, in addition to the mechanical chewing, hopefully, which many of us are not great at, but that's the start of our digestion. Then the food makes its way down, hopefully, the esophagus into the stomach, and we have this big bolus or chyme. At this point, we have some more help with our digestion. Now that's gonna depend on having good stomach acid. That's really important here. That stomach acid actually activates an enzyme that helps to begin to unwind these big proteins that we have in the stomach, they're really large and complex. And a little bit of fat digestion, but mostly protein. And again, that stomach acid is really important. Then after, depending on the size of your meal, could be one, two, or even three hours, that food is then dumped into the top of the small intestines. At this point, the digestion is further aided with uh, two things. One is with bile. So you have bile that is produced by your liver. It's collected in like a little purse almost, your gallbladder. And when you eat a meal, especially with fats, it's going to dump some bile there. That's going to help break up those fat molecules into smaller parts, making it easier for the digestive enzymes then to make their way around. At the same time, we have the um, pancreas. So here's the pancreas. And your pancreas is also going to dump some whole bunch of enzymes there. And those enzymes are pretty broad spectrum. So you, here you'll have the digestion of carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. So kind of all your major, what we call macronutrients will be digested here, but the job is not done yet. Then you have you know, smaller and smaller particles as you go down. Lastly, along all along the small intestines, there's an area called kind of the brush border. There are more enzymes there and they're gonna break up the last little components till they're small enough to absorb and digest. So that's essentially what happens. And you're just eating food, not even thinking about it. All happens very nicely. So there are different types of enzymes. And, um, and now, there are many types of enzymes in the body, many of which are not involved in digestion at all. But even for digestion, you have different kinds of enzymes. You have those that digest proteins, other kinds that digest fats, and others that digest carbohydrates. And even within those, you have different types that digest different types of carbohydrates. So there's a lot of them. We've got over 75,000 enzymes at least in our body, not for digestion, but overall. And in many cases, enzymes help to uh, speed up different reactions in the body. So they're involved in many things. And I will be covering one enzyme that, that I will show you does more than just digest our food. So just as an example here, let's say this is your protein. As I mentioned, proteins are this really large, long molecule made up of, you know, it's almost like Legos, individual little amino acids joined together and they're all wrapped around and, um, and then the enzymes will slowly kind of unwrap this structure, then break it into smaller parts and smaller parts and smaller parts until you get to the smallest. But here, now this isn't actually a digestive enzyme, but it's uh, similar, I wanted to show you because it's, it was just a great picture. 
this here is what an enzyme sort of would look like, which is a giant protein in itself. And you can imagine these long strings here as proteins and the enzymes are breaking down these proteins. Uh, and they will do that in the body. They'll break down other proteins, not necessarily just food proteins. So uh, I love this picture, just so fascinating to see what they actually might look like. And enzymes, just like all of us, you know, we work better under certain conditions. If you're too hot, uh, maybe slow you down, that sort of thing. So enzymes too are particular. They need a certain temperature. Typically, you know, our normal body temperature is ideal. They need the right pH. So some enzymes uh, thrive at a more acidic environment in your stomach and others in a more alkaline environment. So lower down the digestive tract, but they are particular. And enzymes, as wonderful as they are, they don't work alone. So if the enzymes are Batman, then they require a lot of assistance, the Robins. There are many out there. So if you look in your basic multivitamin, many of the components of a multivitamin would be, you know, are assisting enzymes, many of the B vitamins, and vitamin A and vitamin C and zinc and, and so on. So a lot of helpers. Now, when you go and look and shop for enzymes, there are actually different kinds of enzymes that come from different places. So I'm going to go through, so you're going to really be a savvy shopper. When you go look for the enzymes, you're going to be able to tell where they come from and more about them, I'm sure, than most people. So I'm going to start with pancreatic enzymes. These are enzymes that come from the pancreas. These have the longest history, so 100 years of use in medicine. And what they are is it's a concentrated, almost the juice, our pancreas produces this juice, and that is put into a supplement. There are different sources, but obviously this is not vegetarian, it's animal sourced. So, um, you know, it can come from, uh, from a pig or from a bull, and they're standardized to contain minimum amounts of enzymes that digest fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. So this is a close-up look at a label. And you, can, you know that these enzymes come from the pancreas because it says so here. Amylase is the enzyme that breaks down carbohydrates. Protease breaks down proteins. That's a little easy to remember because it's protein. And lipase, you know, lipids or fats break down fats. And these interesting, you know, like the USB, these units here are not the weight of the enzyme, but the activity level that describes like, and that is more important when it comes to enzymes, not so much the, the weight or the milligrams, but the activity level, if you want to compare. And there are actually uh, medically speaking, and in our mainstream medical history, there are people who have been treated with enzymes and, or who are known to have or have the potential to have a deficiency in enzymes. So these are, I'm talking about people who have either they're not producing enough or they're not secreting enough from their pancreas. Who would these people be? Well, there's, there's different uh, people that uh, may be at risk for this. Certainly anyone with an actual disease of the pancreas, so chronic pancreatitis, that's an inflammation of the pancreas. Um, someone who's had gastric bypass surgery, um, celiac disease, which um, some of you may have heard of. This is when there's you know, um, gluten intolerance, uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So these are, um, not too common, but common enough. Uh, digestive issues, HIV, diabetes, advanced renal disease, and even in the elderly, it's thought that uh, people may have some reduction in the production of uh, the enzymes of the pancreas. I mean, everything sort of slows down as we age, typically. And different ways that this may be diagnosed. One is, you know, ways of measuring fat malabsorption, seeing if the, the fat is passing through us rather than being absorbed. And we could also measure certain vitamins that might give us a clue. So for example, if you are not absorbing your fat 
very well because you don't have enough digestive enzymes to absorb that fat. You also won't be absorbing your fat soluble vitamins very well. So those can be measured. And this is just as an example of treating celiac disease with enzymes. I've personally never heard of anyone being treated, any of my clients in the past, from mainstream medicine. I don't ever remember anyone being prescribed enzymes. Doesn't mean it never happens, but I've never heard of it. So I don't believe it's very common. Um, but, you know, must have existed or in theory it exists. But with celiac disease, um, often people who have it, some of them may have uh, chronic loose stools or diarrhea. And this is thought to be related to, or at least is also low levels of certain pancreatic enzymes. And here's just a, a little, very small study of 20 patients who had celiac disease who were put on um, pancreatic enzymes. So these would have had little bits of all of the enzymes. And the results were that it improved their bowel movements, the consistency and the urgency, and eight of them were able to discontinue their, I'm assuming, treatment of drugs or mainstream medicine treatment um, due to the fact that their, their symptoms were resolved. So just an example of how, at least in a study, even if it doesn't happen much in mainstream medicine, enzymes have been used to treat a particular issue. Um, there are prescription pancreatic enzymes apparently that exist. Again, I don't, uh, I don't see them in use, but uh, it, it is something in existence. And they, in theory, can be prescribed for a number of diseases, celiac disease, cystic fibrosis, um, having a blocked pancreatic duct, probably because the enzymes will dissolve that, you know, uh, whatever it is that's blocking the duct by breaking it down, just like it breaks down our food, um, etc. So thought I'd just give you a little bit of background on that because there's kind of a quite the history in terms of longevity and some studies for pancreatic enzymes. But then moving forward into kind of more modern enzymes that you find, there are other sources which have some advantages over pancreatic enzymes, um, including the fact that they're of course vegetarian for those who wish to avoid, who's vegetarian or vegan to avoid those um, pancreatic enzymes. So plant derived enzymes can be ingested too. So the most common sources for plant derived enzymes are from pineapple, Typically, they come from the, this part, not from the fruit part, the stem, maybe it's called, and from papaya. Or if you come from my home country in South Africa, we would call it pawpaw. And I think the enzymes come from the seeds, but there are enzymes in, in all of the fruit. So here is a close-up of a label, and you can see that some of the enzymes come from the papaya, some from the pineapple, which is bromelain. And here are, again, this is the the um, these funny looking descriptions at the end describe the activity rather than the milligrams, which is the weight, which is the more important thing to look at. But these units are not the same as the ones from the pancreas. And that is that um, the way enzyme activity is described is not standardized. So you're never going to be able to compare kind of a uh, fruit derived enzyme to a pancreatic one. You can only compare you know, similar ones with the same units. But what's interesting about these fruit derived enzymes is they, for the most part, are just digesting proteins. That's their focus on proteins. And why would we wanna use plant enzymes? Well, I've already said, because they're vegetarian and vegan is one advantage, but there's an other advantages over the pancreatic not saying pancreatic are bad, but I'm just describing some advantages, which is that some of these fruit derived enzymes can be active in a broader pH in the body. Um, so uh, pancreatic enzymes are not too great when they're in a very acidic environment, like in the stomach, and they can be inactivated where the plant enzymes are not and can survive that little bit. So by combining the both, you could take advantage of both. There are some commercial uses for uh, papain, 
or the papaya enzymes. So they are actually used as a meat tenderizers. And then, so we've got pancreatic enzymes. I've shown you the, the fruit or plant derived, but we also get enzymes from fungi. Now this may seem strange to you, what, from fungi, but actually this is a common way to produce many natural products that you might have used. Most B vitamins are also, you know, that we don't take them out of a, a whole plant or something that produced by um, bacteria or fungi. Um, and you might've heard that now digestive tract, of course, full of trillions of bacteria. Some of those produce different vitamins for us. So it's not so strange. So if you look at this up close of this plant um, enzyme product, you can see here that Aspergillus niger and Oryzae, that is a description of a, a fungus and those are used to produce enzymes. So there are no, no fungi in this product or in these products. So you don't have to worry if you're thinking like, uh, I've, I've been sometimes asked questions like, well, if I have um, overgrowth of yeast or I'm supposed to avoid mushrooms or fungi or something, is that a problem? No, because there's no, no fungi. It, they just produce them sort of like, here you go. And then they're put in the product. Um, so in this particular product, the, the fungus are producing and donating enzymes to break down fats and carbohydrates and proteins so they can produce all of it. Now here is, look at that, so beautiful. That is uh, one of our fungi, the Aspergillus niger. It's just, you know, gorgeous, I think. And the advantage over pancreatic enzymes is just like the, I said with the fruit derived enzymes, it has a, a bigger range of um, acid stability. So it can survive in more parts of the digestive tract and it has a wider range of activity on different types of carbohydrates than just the pancreatic enzyme. So it can act on more, a variety of complex carbohydrates. Those are really big carbohydrates as it's uh, described. Uh, starches like potatoes, cellulose, which is often the cell walls of plant foods that we have to um, break up so that we can properly digest them. And they actually have a long history in food preparation but maybe different than pancreatic enzymes. So for example, there's a long history of use of this enzyme, alpha-galactosidase for those who have bean intolerance to help with that. So breaking down some of the carbohydrates in beans so we're less gassy. And I'm sure you've heard of lactase, which is an enzyme for those who have dairy or lactose intolerance. Uh, in dairy. Uh, so both of those enzymes are courtesy of these fungal enzymes. And if you're wondering, I can't see your questions yet, but if you're wondering, you know, how do these compare, very generally speaking, pan to pancreatic enzymes, the fungal enzymes or the fruit enzymes, there are no human studies comparing, like, what if you take the equal amounts of equal activity of the two different ones. There's no studies at all. So in a lot of products, we combine them all to take advantage of all of them. And in some products, we only have the vegetarian derived ones for those who are vegetarian or vegan. Now this talk tonight, of course, is about enzymes, but I want to mention a couple of other ingredients that you often find combined in enzyme products that are also important for our digestion. One of those is stomach acid. So in this not so fancy diagram I created, but stomach acid is so important. Even though acid is given a bad rap, you know, people just talk about it like, oh, you don't want the body to be too acidic. Uh, and we think of acidity as in like acid reflux, but it is normal, healthy, and good for our stomach to be very acidic. There are only a few situations where we want to block that acidity, um, like if you have an active ulcer or inflammation, but otherwise that acid's really important. It protects us. It's our first line of defense when we put foreign microbes, which we all are, there's bacteria all over our food into our body. But that acid also acts as a signal to 
activate a protein digesting enzyme in our stomach. So if we don't have enough stomach acid, then that protein digestion will be deficient. And it's also important for the absorption of a number of very important vitamins, uh, our iron, vitamin B12, and calcium, as well as others. So in a healthy individual, if you're between meals, so you're fasting, it's normal actually for the pH in your stomach to be less than three. So that's very acidic. Um, for those who have what's called hypochlorhydria, meaning they have deficient or low stomach acid, they would be above three while they're fasting. And there are some people who even have, you know, who don't have any stomach acid and that would be high up. So they have a very alkaline stomach, not a good thing. You will also see in some products, which I'm gonna show you at the end, bile added into enzymes. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about bile, the role of bile. So as I've mentioned, bile is important in digesting fats. It's an emulsifier. It takes big fat particles and breaks them up into small little pieces. So the enzymes have has more of a surface area to get around and in and break them down. Um, bile is also thought to reduce SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. That's a condition, kind of more of a, a newer condition that has been named and also important for metabolic signaling. So many things, acid and bile in our body also provide signals for other things to happen. And so why might it be necessary to take bile externally? Well, that would be either if we're not producing enough or perhaps we are producing enough, but it's poorly timed. It's not coming out um, when we eat a fatty meal when we need it, or it's not all coming out at once. Now, a really good example of this is going to be for the people who don't have a gallbladder. If you don't have a gallbladder, you still produce bile because it's produced in the liver, but you have nowhere to collect it so that you can build up a whole bunch so you can release a lot of it when you eat a fatty meal. So it's never going to be as efficient. And this is a close up of a label so you can see that. Um, this has the, this is basically cholic acid is a, a bile acid. So this is bile, comes from a gallbladder. And this actually comes from a bull. That's what the boss taurus is, even though this may make you think of an ox, but it's not. And medical uses for bile, again, um, medical uses, maybe historically or theoretically, I'm not aware of personally, don't remember anyone being prescribed bile, but cystic fibrosis, and I never had clients with cystic fibrosis anyway. So um, people who've had the gallbladder removed, um, short bowel syndrome, and you know, various issues with the, with the bile duct. So there are potential medical uses. Now this, is just something I wanted to mention. If you're looking around for enzymes, you might notice that some of them, they're not usually, but sometimes you'll see they are enteric coded enzymes. It's a special coding that sort of allows it to bypass the stomach and then open up when it gets to the small intestines. The theoretical advantage of that is, as I mentioned, some of the pancreatic enzymes are sensitive to stomach acid and may be deactivated in the stomach. But the problem actually, I don't recommend enterocoded, seems like a good idea, but the problem is what happens is that if this is not sitting in the stomach, then when it gets dumped into the small intestines, then those enzymes don't have a chance to mix up with all the food because if they don't make contact with all the food, they're not going to be helpful for digestion. Sitting in the stomach for two to three hours is the best way for those enzymes to kind of dance and mix and get really mixed up well with the food. Um, so it, what happens is it makes the product more expensive, 
but it probably doesn't provide any benefit, may even be worse. Now, drug companies have very sophisticated ways of overcoming that issue, uh, but you won't find those in any supplement companies using these technologies are very, very, very expensive. Um, so I generally don't suggest enterocoded enzymes. The way to maybe get around that, and there's a little bit of evidence for the um, in the stomach for reducing maybe the pancreatic enzymes being disarmed in the stomach is to take those enzymes after you've eaten a little bit of food, like after you've had a few mouthfuls, so it's mixing in with the food versus taking it first on an empty stomach, which is when the stomach is most acidic. Once you start eating food, your stomach will become a little less acidic because Hopefully your food is not as acidic as your stomach is. If it is, then you know, then you must be eating just Coke and other things that are extremely acidic. It's possible, but not, not generally speaking. So there was this not much in the way of studies in terms of when's the best time to take enzymes, but based on one small study here, and it doesn't surprise me based on what I'm saying, it seems it's probably best to take enzymes during a meal or after a meal rather than before on an empty stomach. All right, so now that you know, hopefully quite a bit and more than you knew when you started, we're gonna look, we're gonna look at some enzyme products and you're going to um, kind of more easily be able to figure out what you're seeing and also maybe decide what may work best for you or somebody else. Um, Nope, um, just uh, in terms of way of information that you can take to your healthcare provider if you're interested in anything. So this product, Super Enzymes, is a, a bestseller right now. It's a very comprehensive formula and potent. And I'm going to describe a few things and show you a few things in it. Now, this particular product has all the enzymes uh, or different sources from the pancreas, a fungal derived and fruit derived. You can see pancreatic enzymes. Here are the three for fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. It has the fruit derived enzymes, another fruit derived and another fruit. So those are the fruit derived enzymes. And you can see here the Aspergillus niger, a couple of those. So it has the fungal derived as well to kind of provide a, all of the different advantages that I have mentioned. But it also has some this is betaine hydrochloride, which is a fancy way of saying stomach acid in there for a little assistance. And it has some bile in it as well. So very comprehensive um, with those extra aids as well. And you know, so this is going to target all of your macronutrients, the carbohydrates, the proteins, um, the fats also help a little bit with the stomach acid, so that's for proteins and fats by way of bile. And again, I've mentioned some of the reasons why those may be low in some cases with different diseases and such. Um, in most cases, for most people with these enzymes, it's going to be trial and error. You're not going to be getting any sophisticated tests. And you're just going to see you know, how they make you feel uh, by way of digestion. I mean, you know, um, if you have bloating, gas, or anything like that, then it's just a matter of comparing to how you felt uh, on a normal basis and how you feel once you're taking enzymes. Now, here's a different product. It's one of my favorite because it's really so tasty and easy to take. Don't even need water is, uh, is uh, the now papaya enzyme. So they're chewable, definitely makes them convenient and tasty. From my experience, having been in um, worked at a health food store for many years, I did uh, just one one day a week. Really loved it. Learned a lot from people, but seniors really, really love this product. Now, this product uh, it does target all of the macronutrients, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, but heavily focused on the proteins because you can see here it has these uh, fruit derived enzymes. Um, and for elderly people, but not only for elderly people, uh, in some cases, not all of them, people will have less stomach acid. 
um, or based on some preliminary studies, um, even if their stomach acid is normal when they're fasting, they may not produce them as efficiently or quickly once triggered by a meal. So that should also trigger the, you know, to increase the production. And yeah, for whatever reason, people find this one very helpful. I remember it's selling a lot amongst the seniors. But I like it because when I'm traveling or, you know, in a restaurant or whatever it is, it's just so nice, easy to pop and to chew and just tastes lovely, like a really nice fruity taste. So the papaya enzymes um, help, will help digest not only proteins, but that's a focus. It's also a source of antioxidants because it didn't actually point it out, but it has actual whole papaya in it as well, not just the enzymes. And it does say on the label with mint and chlorophyll for fresh breath. And yes, actually both of these are typically and commonly used for fresh breath. So could be used as a little bit of a, a um, breath freshener as well. And you just chew two of them up to three times a day. I'm not gonna show the risk information for all the products, but I just wanted to show you for one, just so I can kind of demystify some of this, which can look scary and it's not really all that bad and just explain a few things, but it's going to be repeated with most enzymes. So consult a healthcare practitioner if you're pregnant or breastfeeding prior, that's kind of standard with just about every supplement anywhere in a health food store, enzymes or not that kind of caution. Um, for people who have yeah, some kind of a, leisure, a lesion or ulcer, so when you have you know, broken tissue, sensitive tissue, you don't want to put en add enzymes, which will further you know, can digest and irritate the area. So I think that's definitely good advice um, to ask a practitioner if that's the case. If you're taking anticoagulants or blood thinners, so that is because Enzymes, uh, some cases have been shown to uh, have a thinning effect on the blood, maybe dose dependent, but it's just a good thing to definitely run by your doctor if you're on prescription blood thinners where, you know, there's a very small margin of safety, then you certainly want to definitely run that by your doctor. So I think that's good advice um, or an anti-inflammatory um, that, you know, I'm trying to get into the, the mind of Health Canada, but I think it's because some uh, enzymes, which I'm going to show you, may have anti-inflammatory actions. And anytime you have something that may have the same or similar actions as a drug, Health Canada is just very conservative in suggesting run this by your doctor. Run it by your doctor, consult a healthcare practitioner, is certainly less of a harsh suggestion than some products will say, do not use if, and then you know like there's really some major concern. Um, or if you're having surgery. Now that's because again, if it may thin the blood, when you have surgery, you always wanna be careful with blood thinners because you're more likely to, to bleed, you know, during or after the surgery. Um, so typically people are told to stay away from anything unless they're on a prescription. Um, or if you have an allergy to latex or, and it lists a bunch of fruits here, um, so there's something called latex fruit syndrome, which is, uh, you can look it up, but this syndrome explains that there's some kind of a, it's kind of inexplicable, but for people who are allergic to latex, and you usually already know that from latex gloves, those people are more likely to be allergic to a number of fruits maybe they're sort of in the same family as the because the latex is comes from a tree so there's a cross reactivity so if you have an allergy to latex you're more likely to have an allergy to a number of these fruits including um the i think it was the papaya yeah so it's so it's potential if someone has a latex allergy they could have uh a reaction to a product like this. So they need to be aware of that or cautious. Um, and that's really, I think the bulk of what I wanted to say. Um, and it did say in, in some of the other enzymes, it says, you know, to not 
use enzymes if you're on antibiotics, that's because at least one type of enzyme has been shown to increase the activity of antibiotics, must make them more effective, linger around longer, but you know, it could be too much of a good thing. So that's the reason for that. All right, so on to bromelain, which is, now this is a, a single enzyme with a very interesting potential uses. So this product has just one type of enzyme in it, and that is bromelain. And you can see it just says digestive enzyme. So it doesn't seem particularly interesting, but on some bromelain products, it just depends on what the company chooses to put on here. Um, Health Canada also endorses the following statement for bromelain, um, that it can be used for minor pain, swelling, and inflammation relief. So that's pretty interesting. It's an enzyme that can be used to digest food or for these other things uh, with a really important detail that's not necessarily on the product, which is if you want to use bromelain to digest food, then you need to eat it with your food. But if you want it to be helpful for pain, swelling or inflammation, you need to have it between meals away from food. Because if you take it with food, it's just going to digest the food and there won't be anything left. But bromelain has been shown to, if you take it on an empty stomach, it can get absorbed and then make its way into your bloodstream. And it can do other things, which is not that crazy. If you know the broader story of enzymes in the body, enzymes do all kinds of things in the body. They, remember I said, they speed up reactions. They're busy bodies involved in all kinds of things. So yeah, it blows my line, mind a little bit, but there are diff all kinds of properties that have been described of bromelain. We need more clinical trials to fully understand, but it seems that bromelain may help to reduce pain as an analgesic, to break up uh, fibrin in the body um, as an antiplatelet, so that can have a sort of blood thinning effect, which is why there's those warnings, and even antibacterial anti-inflammatory effects and helping to modulate the immune system. So here is um, a study or um, I should say a, an article talking about the therapeutic use of bromelain enzyme to treat acute sinusitis. So there's an inflammation here uh, in children in Germany. So children under the age of 11 years old diagnosed with acute sinusitis uh, were using bromelain in the study, 116 patients, and their recovery as compared to the placebo group who wasn't receiving uh, was faster. They had the shortest average period of symptoms and self-limiting mild allergic reaction only. Now I have to point out that Health Canada endorses the, the use of bromelain for age 18 and over only. It doesn't say for children, so that just needs to be said. Um, but if you have a, you know, a doctor, a naturopath that someone you can work with, you can certainly uh, pass on this information. Now, um, bromelain sometimes in complementary and alternative medicine circles is used for things such as for those who have allergies or asthma. So here's an interesting description of how bromelain uh, can work. Now this has been only in mouse models. We haven't tested this in humans, but proof of principle, as they call it in mouse models, they have shown that what bromelain can do is, now this lovely looking creature, I think they all in our immune system called a dendric cell, uh, is quite incredible. So what it does is it, you know, it scans around looking for things that seem foreign or, you know, like this is not supposed to be here in the body. And that is going to be in some cases, pollen or other kinds of protein that your body decides are not good and are going to then, you know, if, you're, if your body makes that decision, if your immune system decides this should not be here, um, it can cause a sensitization where in future you're going to have an allergic response. So how does that happen is you have this, this uh, lovely cell and it finds that what it considers a foreign, let's say pollen particle, the antigen, it uh, attaches it 
and then it uh, and then some other cells from the immune system come along and they're kind of um, make this they pass on the message to this cell and it's a whole long cascade and it's a very long and interesting story but essentially this cell is now going to tell other parts of the immune system hey this is a problem so in future when you see this particle we need to mount a response which is kind of allergies allergic responses so what bromelain does is because i kind of think of enzymes sometimes as pac-man break down things is it's thought that they break down these surface markers that the that the dendritic cell needs in order to be able to present these particles to the rest of the immune system and therefore might at least in in mouse models might mitigate or prevent that allergic reaction from having and so that's why it has been used in clinical practice for allergies now i'm sorry if this i should have said um uh, warning but i forgot this one was coming up trigger warning for some people who don't like to look at these kind of pictures they were a lot worse trust me but this is a very interesting uh, use for bromelain, which is in use, not in the pill form though, um, in some kind of a bromelain applied topically, um, but it has been used actually for healing with burn victims. So again, it's enzymes, it breaks down things. So the bromelain, is thought to break down the debris. So when you have an injury or even a lot of inflammation, you've got a lot of chaos going and cells get you know, sort of destroyed and, and bits and pieces of our body are literally like just uh, lying around, <laughs> um, getting in the way and causing congestion. And so the bromelain will come and sort of break up these bits so they can get cleared out. You know, in order to get good healing and nutrients coming in and blood flow, we need to do a little bit of cleanup. They'll remove dead cells. And so um, this has been called enzymatic surgery for burns in clinical trials. And bromelain has also been used uh, or studied for osteoarthritis and believed to have an analgesic, so reducing pain and anti-inflammatory uh, sort of effect. So oh, looking at my time here. And uh, in those studies, it's been shown to be useful in combination with other either drugs or natural supplements. It hasn't been used in isolation, so it's a little bit ambiguous as to how it would work alone. But in summary, for, bloma, for bromelain, um, common uses, at least in complementary and alternative medicine for bromelain, include all of these clots, allergies, digestion, osteoarthritis, wound healing, seasonal allergies, and so on. But these are the two that Health Canada endorses. But if you think about it, minor pain and swelling and inflammation, well, pain, swelling, and inflammation are pretty common symptoms to be experienced with most of these, right? When you have a wound, you have pain, swelling, and inflammation. When you have, you know, sinusitis, you often have pain, swelling, and inflammation. So, uh, sort of does extend to those. Uh, now I want to show you a, another really comprehensive digestive enzyme that is quite amazing, but different to the one I showed you before, Digest Ultimate. Now this is not how the label looks. I organized it this way so that I can impress upon you just how amazing this is. All of these types of enzymes here in the green are different types of enzymes that digest different types of carbohydrates. So a huge range of carbohydrates. This is a great product for anyone who's on a mostly or all plant-based diet, who's having trouble with it, you know, bloating, gas, could be someone who's just transitioned to an all plant-based diet or whatever it is, really wants to eat a plant-based diet, but is having difficulty. Um, it also has a range of different protein digesting enzymes. And these numbers here, like three, four, six, and six to seven represent the different pHs, the different ranges of acidity to alkalinity that these different enzymes act in so that they can act throughout the digestive tract. And as far as I know, there is only one type of enzyme for fats. Proteins and carbs are more, uh, more complicated.
So you can see it's a very, very comprehensive formula. Uh, to look at it in a different way, these are the different types of plant-based foods that the different enzymes in this products can will focus on. So for starchy vegetables, you have enzymes. For leafy vegetables, different enzymes. Broccoli, cabbage, and beans, which a lot of people have trouble with, one particular enzyme, fruits. Dairy, so this product has uh, lactase in it, which is uh, very problematic for those who are lactose intolerant. Seeds and nuts and grains has got, um, now this is a very, very interesting enzyme um, because this enzyme, I don't know if you've heard of, there's certain nutrient blockers that naturally exist in plant-based foods. Phytase is one of them. Um, so it makes it harder when we're eating as a you know, person who's vegetarian to access different minerals like iron and zinc. So when you're a vegetarian, you need to eat more iron and zinc than, some, than your counterpart is not vegetarian just to get the same amount because those the zinc and iron is kind of trapped in the foods and harder to access. And so phytase may, in theory, liberate those minerals and help with their absorption, even though there's no, no study particularly on using the enzymes, but I thought that was a fascinating one. And here I just put it in a, in a different way. So here's all of those different um, carbohydrate digesting enzymes and a description of what they made or known to do. Not necessarily, these are not product claims, but here's an interesting one. Beta gluconase may reduce the coating or biofilm of gastrointestinal candida. So there's the idea out there that sometimes certain things that may bother us like candida can be stubborn and hard to get rid of because they are, they kind of encase themselves in this film of slime making our immune system um, sort of oblivious to the fact that they're there. Um, so this is just uh, to say basically that there are actual uh, clinical studies showing that if you take lactose, it will help with the absorption of milk for those who are lactose intolerant, which is not really that surprise. In the study, they added the enzyme five minutes before consuming um, the product. Also, for those of you, and this is all the rage, who drink um, oat milk, and I actually make my own, the companies who make oat milk actually use uh, digestive enzymes. In particular, they use amylase, which is in all of our digestive enzymes, but the highest amounts are in this product. They use amylase to help break down the big carbohydrates, the big starches in, in the oats so that it is less slimy. So there's been some suggestions out there. Here was one where people are offering a recipe on how to make oat milk. And I've done this, I've made it with the enzymes and it is less slimy for sure uh, if you use the digestive enzymes. So that's a unique use for it. And just by way of comparison of the super enzymes and the digest ultimate, because these are two of our most comprehensive digestive formulas, um, if you want like kind of a you know, big overlook, oh, which one um, might be more suitable? Well, again, the super enzymes is not vegetarian, but it does contain the bile for fat digestion and acid for proteins. So it has that advantage of these. And, you know, I put um, helpful maybe for the elderly with indigestion only because, and I can't diagnose anyone here, but Typically, you're more likely to have low stomach acid or not have a gallbladder the older you are. But for those on a plant-based diet or who want something vegetarian or vegan, who are lactose intolerant, or just basically experiencing difficulty with plant-based foods, Digest Ultimate is definitely a great formula for that. And I just wanted to mention that um, there is this other plant-based enzyme formula which is, I would say, it's just a, a much more tempered version of uh, enzymes in terms of the activity levels here are much lower. So also the price point will be lower, but for someone who maybe doesn't have really any digestive, not much of digestive issues, you don't need anything dramatic, 
then you may be perfectly fine with this kind of lower potency and less full spectrum enzyme. Not everybody needs the heavy, heavy hitter. And that brings me to the end. Um, thank you so much for those who have attended and uh, gonna take questions. I'm gonna go look at the Q&A. So for anyone who joined late, uh, just another reminder that I'm going to the Q&A section, not to the chat section to look for your questions. Um, so if you've written anything in the chat instead of the Q&A, please write it in the Q&A now. And I went a little bit over time, I apologize, but I will still provide um, you know, 15 minutes of Q&A. Um, and thank you to Wesley, in case I forget to say at the end, who's moderating there uh, for being here and helping out. All right, so just give me a minute here. I'm gonna stop the screen sharing. <laughs>